Hey there, my name is Ranger Amy, and I work for the North Carolina Forest Service. If you look at my patch, you see the green tree in the center. You know that forest rangers help to take care of the trees in the forest. By taking care of the forest, we can help take care of the animals that also make their homes in the forest. Take a look at this picture over here, and you can see all the animals that live in the logs on the ground, and the dead and dying trees that are standing, the mature trees that provide us with lots and lots of shade, and some of the growing seedlings and saplings. Trees make homes for animals, and they also help to make homes for people. Did you know that in our classroom, in our workplaces, and at home, there are over 5,000 items that come from trees? Forest rangers help to take care of those trees so that we can have these forest products. The obvious thing that comes from trees, of course, is lumber. But did you know that things like maple syrup, crayons, and even ingredients from toothpaste comes from trees. How many people brush their teeth this morning? By taking care of the trees in the forest, we can have these items, but we need to learn how to identify healthy trees in the forest. We're gonna have to go inside of the tree to find out. In this lesson, we will cover what tree growth rings are and how to count them. We will learn more about the parts of the inside of the tree and the layers that make those growth rings and their names. We will talk about where trees grow and the environmental conditions that allow trees to grow fast or stump their growth. We will look at other clues about the tree and its growth patterns. And finally, we'll take a sample of tree growth rings with an increment bore. So first, let's talk about this tree. Sometimes we like to call it a tree cookie because it looks like a cookie, but this is a stump. It was cut from a tree. And when you get the stump, when it first um, is made, it's kind of rough on one side and, it, and we like to make it smooth on the other side. So what we did is we sanded it down and then we covered it with a clear coating. And that way we can see these rings right here. So how about we take a look at the center of the tree, which is called the pith. And in another example, you can see the pith here. And that pith comes in a variety of different shapes. That's the center of the tree. This one happens to come from a walnut tree. And if you look at it, it has an alternating pattern between a light color and a dark color. And that's really important for us to be able to count the number of rings. Those rings represent the age of the tree. Now the growth rings tell us a lot about the tree and the way that the tree grew. And first thing that we can learn is that each ring represents a year of growth. So we can actually start at the center, the pith, and we can count together how many rings all the way to the bark. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen rings. We like to add about three to five rings. So this tree could be 16 to 18 years old. That's really cool. Forest rangers take standardized measurements commonly 4.5 feet above the ground. This is called diameter at breast height. Since it takes a few years for the tree to grow 4.5 feet, we add a few extra years to approximate the age. This tree also grew really fast. Take a look at the distance between the rings. The distance tells us that the tree had plenty of nutrients from the soil and water and sunlight. 
And it wasn't in competition and fighting for those nutrients, water, and sunlight with its other tree neighbors that are in the forest. If you take a look at this example here, the growth rings are much closer. We might even have to bring that a little closer to the camera so you can see. But those growth rings are much closer, and we might even have to bring out a microscope to look at those rings. So that tells us that something happened in the environment that caused this tree to be a little bit stressed out, and it did not grow nearly as fast as this one here. And that's important for us to understand so we can help to take care of the trees, the distance between those growth rings. Now, what do you think happened? Why do you think at the pith, at the center of the tree, that tree's growth rings were really wide and then they started to get closer and closer? And if you look towards the edge, all the way there towards the cambium layer and the inner bark and outer bark and the bark itself, those rings are really close together. That probably means that there was some sort of competition in the forest and this tree really struggled to grow. And when we're producing lumber and those 5,000 items for humans to use in their homes, it's important that we understand the environmental conditions that create this growth pattern versus this growth pattern. It would take an awful lot of time to grow this tree and turn it into something like a picnic table compared to this tree right here. Now that we've had a chance to practice counting the growth rings, let's look at the layers inside of the tree where those growth rings are made. We can look at the pith and then we can look at the center and the center is called the heartwood. And in this example here, the heartwood has decomposed and broken down and it's no longer there. And that's a natural process that happens with trees. Here's another example where we can see the heartwood really well. The heartwood is a dark color and then the sapwood is a lighter color. Once you have a chance to see the heartwood, which is dark, and the sap color, which is lighter, we can take an even closer look and underneath the bark we have what's called the inner bark and that's where most of the growth happens. You have a layer of tissues which is called the phloem and that's the inner bark and you can see in our picture over here where the inner bark is. And that has a specific job. Then we have the cambium layer, and that's the part of the tree that the beaver just loves to eat. And that's this green one right here, the cambium layer. And then the sapwood, which is called the xylem, takes water and it push, pushes it all the way up the trunk of the tree and so we can say that nutrients go flowing down the phloem and zipping up the xylem. And they're kind of like straws and they help to move nutrients and water from the top of the tree to the roots and from the roots back through the rest of the tree. So it's important that we understand that the cambium layer and the xylem and the phloem is what makes our growth rings, which is what you can see here. And you can see that there's two different colors of growth rings. The lighter color, which is the growth that takes place in the springtime. And then the darker color, which is the growth that takes place in the summer. Now, why do you think the lighter springtime growth is so much wider than the darker summertime growth? It has to do with how much water the weather provides in the springtime. Think about the saying, April showers brings May flowers. There's a lot more water available 
And in the summer, sometimes there's drought or no rain, and it's harder um, to grow. And so that has a big role in the difference in those two growth rings. So growth patterns are real important, and we can see the spring growth, which is the lighter color, and the summer growth, which is the darker color. We can count the, re the rings to estimate the age of that tree. We can also identify some other stressors that were in the environment that may have caused that tree to slow down its growth just a little bit. So, we might see some scars on that tree. And here's an example of a tree scar or a boo-boo. And something could have happened. It could have been bumped by a piece of machinery. There could have been a fire and it got burned. There could have been um, some other activity. There could be insects that are eating the inside of the tree. But that's an example of a scar that we might look for to see the history of what happened on that landscape to learn more about the tree's growth pattern and what happened. Here's an example of what it looks like when you cut down the tree and look at the stump and you can see where there was four or five branches that came out. You see how they're um, coming across the center of the tree there. Now, like I said, sometimes we have hollow trees and that can be heart rot, that can be diseases or other decay that takes place inside of the tree, but that's kind of a natural thing that happens as trees get older and older. And so as forest rangers, this tree is real important for wildlife. You can imagine it's a cavity for animals like raccoons and owls and maybe flying squirrels but it's pretty hard for us to make a picnic table out of this tree here. So we want to make sure that our trees are real healthy and the center of them is healthy as well. That sapwood and that heartwood is preserved, okay? So tree growth rings are important for forest rangers to understand so that we can help to take care of the forest. Now we don't always go through and just cut down the trees in the forest just so that we can identify the age of the tree. We actually have some neat tools and equipment that we walk around the forest with that help us give the exact same information. And we're gonna talk about that tool next. So one of the instruments that a forest ranger uses to collect the same information about tree growth patterns in its environment is something called an increment bore. And the increment bore comes with three parts. And what we do with it is we kind of make a drill it might be something like what your mom or dad uses in the garage to build something with. It has sharp edges that we can use to break the bark and get into the tree. It has some handles on it that we can turn. And then it has this extractor. And when the increment bore goes into the tree, the extractor brings out this great information and it looks kind of like this. And we're actually gonna go look at a tree and you guys are gonna watch how this extractor pulls the increment for core samples out of the tree. So let's go. So remember that the increment bore has three parts. The extractor we're gonna set aside so that we don't lose it. Now the drill part is the sharp part that's gonna break the bark and allow us to get into the tree. Normally we would take diameter at breast height four and a half feet off the ground to make it a standard sample but for the purpose of this video I'm going to go ahead and take an extraction a little bit lower I'm going to wait for the increment bore to bite into the tree Now, if this kind of work looks like fun and you think you might enjoy a career where you get to be outside and you get to take samples of trees and collect data, then being a forest ranger might be something you'd like to consider in the future. 
Our object here is to get to the center of the tree where the pith is. We're gonna take our extractor. We're gonna measure with the extractor to try to estimate where the center of the tree is so we know how far we need to install this increment board to get our core sample. That looks about right. We're going to install this upside down and then we're going to make a turn backwards and extract our sample. So you can see from the sample that we have our bark and then you can actually start to see the rings the summer rings and the spring rings there and they're gonna go um, in a half circle in one direction and once the um, half circle switches directions we know that we've made it to the center of the circle where the pith is and we can start counting from that point and I don't know if you guys can tell the circle ends there so we would back this out and start to count the rings we could try to do it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. And again, we add about 3, 43 years old. Now, this is a white pine, and white pine is a softwood, so it's pretty easy to uh, extract the sample. It's also easy to see the rings. We're gonna take some time to extract our increment bore because the tree is already sending sap to the wound that we've created. And we don't want it to get stuck. Now extracting a core sample is a lot easier on the tree than of course using a chainsaw to cut it down to get to the stump in order to get the same information. Now, I'm a person who really likes trees, so when I take this increment bore out of the tree, I'm actually going to use my sample, since I have plenty of these, I don't need it, and I'm actually going to put it right back into the tree. That way, the tree can heal around that sample, and maybe in the future, a future forest ranger will um, have to cut this tree down because it's hazardous or something like that. And they might get a kick out of some information that we've left there for them. So remember that forest rangers take care of the trees in the forest. And we learn how well those trees are growing, how fast they're growing based on the environmental conditions where they live. The trees in the forest make a habitat for the animals, and by taking care of that habitat, we're taking care of the animals and the trees. And if we encounter a tree such as this, it's probably a good habitat or cavity tree for an animal in the forest. And if we encounter a tree like this, it might be a great candidate to build something out of, like a table or a chair or a window or we might extract the ingredients to make something like maple syrup or soft drinks or ice cream. Now, instead of cutting down the trees to determine the growth patterns, we use what's called an increment borer in order to extract information from that trees to see their growth pattern. I hope you enjoyed our time here learning about tree rings and hopefully you'll come back for another activity with us. Bye!